My name is Frederick Hessman from the University of Göttingen, and I would like to talk to you briefly about taking Kepler's Harmony of the Spheres quite literally. In 1619, Johannes Kepler published his magnum opus, Harmonicis Mundi, in which he described his lifelong search for an explanation for the positions and motions of the planets. His theory consisted of two parts. He had a geometric theory for what the mean separation of the planets was due to. In this case, it was due to the stacking of three-dimensional platonic solids. Here, for instance, you see that the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn is separated by a cube. The motions of the planets were explained by a musical theory. Kepler envisioned that the angular velocities of the planets, as seen from the center, corresponded to actual musical tones, of course, virtual tones, and that these virtual tones were combined in planetary chords, and these planetary chords sounded very harmonic, and hence were of divine origin. The actual prescription that he used, the algorithm he used, is very simple. You take the instantaneous angular velocities of the planets, again as viewed from the center, you assume that the tone, the frequency, is proportional to that velocity, angular velocity. You set the absolute tone by assuming that the angular velocity of the Earth corresponds to the comma tone, the tuning tone of an orchestra, usually about 440 hertz. And once you have that frequency, you round it to the nearest well-tempered note, like the keys of a piano. Kepler, like we do nowadays, believes that notes generally have well-tempered values and that all the semitones between our notes simply are ignored. If you want to turn this into a real piece of music, of course, you have to compress the, the real time, the planetary time, into the duration of the piece in the concert hall. You have to assign each planet, then, of course, to an instrument or voice. And you have to raise or lower that tone by one or more octaves to account for the fact that the total dynamical tonal range of an orchestra is generally very, very much smaller than the total dynamical range of a planetary system. I've written a package called Kepler Music, which does this for you. It takes the orbital motions of planets and turns that into tones, arranges them according to the program's uh, design, and turns it all into a music XML file that can be read by any musical notation editor software to finalize the, the creation of the, of the final scores. I use this algorithm to compose, a, well, a, to arrange, Kepler is the composer, I'm the arranger, to arrange a piece for the Göttingen Symphony Orchestra uh, directed by Antonius Adamska in 2019. This piece was called Creation because it plays the harmony of the spheres at the time that Bishop Usher imagined was the moment of creation, up to the time where Kepler thought it was the moment of creation. And this is roughly what it sounded like. You hear the cello has the most interesting part because the cello is playing Mars. Mars has the largest orbital eccentricity and hence the largest tonal range. Of course, you can apply the same thing to an exoplanetary planetary system. For instance, my colleague Matt Russo produced a video which is the sonification and visualization of the planetary system TRAPPIST-1. I definitely recommend that you see, look, take a look at this video. It's an amazing piece of, uh, of, of art. And they use very interesting algorithms to turn the motions into tones and even came up with a way of producing percuss percussive events uh, that, uh, that give it a very, very nice, um, very nice effect. So please take a look at this video. Of course, they didn't use Kepler's algorithm. They used their own. 
The reason that Russell was interested in this system is because the TRAPPIST-1 planetary system is very, very tightly packed. The planets in this planetary system are in resonance with each other, so-called Lagrange resonances. In this case, the ratios of the orbital periods of the planets are ratios of whole numbers. And when planets are in resonance with each other, they can be packed into much, much tighter configurations than if they aren't. This particular configuration is tightly, very tightly packed, and if you listen to it, the chord is very, very dense. It's very dense because here there are many resonances that are very, very close to each other. In a realistic planetary system, this would never work, and the system would fly apart. You see that musical harmony and planetary orbital dynamics have a lot in common. Pythagorean musical harmony is based upon chords of notes whose frequencies have ratios of um, whose ratios of frequencies are ratios of of whole note whole numbers. For instance, a fifth is a ratio of three to two. In orbital dynamics, the resonances occur when the planet orbital periods are also close to ratios of whole numbers. In musical theory, dissonant chords occur when the frequencies of the notes are too close to each other, or when the frequency ratios are not ratios of whole numbers. And in orbital dynamics, an instability occurs if the orbital periods get too close to each other, and, uh, or, or are close, but simply are not in resonance. Here's a very simple example of an exoplanetary system, Gliese 221. Here we have three planets, a planet very, very close to the central star at high frequencies, and two outer planets that are in a one to four resonance. This means that on average, these two planets produce a note which is three octaves apart. Ignore the screeching of the inner planets and listen to the outer planets, and you'll see that sometimes they are close to having uh, tones th three octaves of apart. But because of the orbital eccentricities, they do wander about a bit before finally returning to an octave. Like now. Here's another example, another resonant system like TRAPPIST-1 called TOI-178. Here there are six planets in very tight resonant orbits, so resonant that we expect this chord to be very, very harmonic. And indeed, it's a perfect C major chord. Here's another example of TRAPPIST-1 where the uh, the uh, camera tone was set to 440 hertz. And the result is basically a very rich major chord. However, if you change the camera tone to 410 or 20 hertz, um, you change the way that the uh, rounding of the, the uh, well-tempered notes um, how the well-tempered notes are rounded, and so you change whether a tone is goes to a higher or a lower note, resulting in a different chord. This is a rather minor sounding chord for the same system. So in conclusion, Kepler's original algorithm really does turn the configurations of planetary systems into uh, musical pieces, and these musical pieces can be turned into scores that normal musicians can play. And the software you need for this will soon be available on GitHub, and I'll give it a very generous license. This process of composing or arranging can be varied to produce very different musical works depending on what you'd like to hear or what you'd like to show. And non-scientists that are listening to these pieces can be taught to hear what the orbital configurations are and to hear whether these systems are close to resonance or not, stable or not.
That means there are millions of possible exoplanetary concerts out there waiting to be played.